what an honor to be here. Uh, and I just want to thank your pastor for inviting me. And I've had a chance to meet his kids and his wonderful wife. And so, again, it's an honor for Danisha and I to be here. Uh, you can tell I got a little bit of a broke throat here this morning. So pray for me as I'm preaching uh, this sermon. <clears throat> We're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning with verse 14. 2 Corinthians 5, beginning with verse 14. Paul is writing, and it states this, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. From this text, I want to speak to you on the title, Rise of the Reconcilers. Rise of the Reconcilers. <clears throat> God, I pray that um, you would take this, this weak voice and you would strengthen it through your spirit that ultimately you would be speaking. And I would just be the vessel, the vehicle that you decided to use to say what you want to say to these, your beloved children, my sisters and brothers. God, I desire to be obedient to your word. So please let it be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Rise of the reconcilers. Well, you're meeting me for the first time, so it'd probably be good for you to know some stuff about me. My wife, Denise, and I were originally from Minneapolis, Minnesota. So in the winter months, we're real glad we live now here in Northern California. And I am really into superhero movies. Oh, no, 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 you don't understand. I am really into superhero movies. Like, I know that Avengers Endgame is coming out in three weeks, yes. This actually goes all the way back to the second Hulk and the end credit scene when General Ross was sitting at a bar and he was so, just so tore up that he couldn't defeat the Hulk. And Tony Stark walks in and he says, I can help you with your Hulk problem. That sets up the trilogy of the Iron Man movies. It also sets up the origin movies of Thor and the origin movie of Captain America. That then leads to the first Avengers and the Hulk comes back. And then from there you get Guardians of the Galaxy. And then you get a little introduction from the first Avengers and Guardians of the galaxy of Thanos, who's going to be the supervillain to tie every of the phases, all four phases of this Marvel Cinematic Universe together. Then you get to Avengers Age of Ultron, and then that is kind of setting the stage for Black Panther and another Thor and another Captain America. Then you got Captain America Civil War, where you get this tension between Iron Man and Captain America, but that's kind of setting the tone for the Black Panther movie that we're going to see, and also the comeback of Bucky, Captain America's partner. That then leads to Avengers Infinity War, and then from there, uh, we also had a third uh, on-ramp of a Spider-Man trilogy, so you had one of those, and now you're going to get coming home after this, which means Spider-Man's not going to die, you're also going to get a Black Panther 2, you're also going to get a Guardians of the Galaxy 3, and you're going to get a Doctor Strange 2, I know some stuff about the Bible as well. But as you can tell, I'm really into superhero movies. Now... This goes back to my childhood as a kid growing up reading comic books, still in the comic books today. My favorite comic book story arc is actually in the DC world. It's a Superman story arc called Bizarro World. And the story arc of Bizarro World goes a little something like this. There's this other realm known as Bizarro. It's an evil, upside down, broken world. It is so evil, so backwards, so upside down, that there's a person who lives in Bizarro World that looks just like Superman, except he's as evil as Superman is good. And the backward, evil, upside down state of Bizarro World is threatening to invade planet Earth. 
Now, to go with this story arc, you have to believe that for the most part, things on planet Earth are good. There's peace, great families. I mean, people get along, they're generous, they're hospitable. I mean, you know, there's no violence. I mean, it's a bizarro world that is evil and broken and upside down. We're fine down here. But the truth is, sisters and brothers, we live in bizarro world. This world that you and I live in right now is an upside down, backwards, broken, sin-filled world. Ah, but here's the good news. Over 2,000 years ago, someone greater than any comic book superhero ever written about, his name is Jesus, came into this upside down, bizarro world. And what Jesus did when he came in this upside down world is he gave you and I a picture of what this upside down world could look like if it was turned right side up again. And he called that the kingdom of God. And he declared the kingdom of God and he demonstrated the kingdom of God. And then Jesus went to the cross for our upside down, broken, bizarro lives. He died and rose out of the grave so that you and I could become right side up people forever. Now one day Jesus is going to return And when Jesus returns, all of creation is going to be set right side up. The bizarro will be over. We will be the beloved community. We will live eternally in the kingdom of God. But who are we to be as the church? Who are we to be as the beloved children of God, the redeemed by Jesus, until such time that Jesus returns? I once heard an old preacher say this, When Jesus returns, this is ultimate justice. But until then, it's just us. God has decided that you and I would be his vehicles of love and truth and forgiveness and generosity and compassion, good news, justice, righteousness in a bizarro, upside-down world until such time that Jesus returns. You and I have to decide in this broken, bizarro, divided world if we will rise as reconcilers, if we will say yes to the calling of making disciples, if we will say yes to the calling to the lost and the broken and the hurting and the prideful and the arrogant. You see, you and I are not just to attend church and be on the sidelines. You and I have a call on our lives. Do you know that any given weekend in the Sacramento metropolitan area, like this weekend, only about 8% of the greater Sacramento metropolitan population is in church like this. There's an opportunity, sisters and brothers, for you and I to rise as God's vehicles of love and redemption and truth and transformation. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul writes his second letter to the church at Corinth. In the first letter, he's mainly focused on who they will be internally. Internally, though they come from diverse backgrounds, though they came to know Jesus through different people, though they were Jew and Gentiles, would they be one? Would they function as one body? not looking down on people thinking they're lesser than, not thinking you're better than because of the part of the body you you are. He says in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, there are many gifts, but one God, one spirit working through all of those gifts. And then he goes into chapter 13 and says, and it's faith, hope, and love that's going to keep this community together. Most importantly, love. Now here in the second letter, he's focused He's trying to get them to focus on who they will be in the city of Corinth and beyond. City of Corinth, a very multicultural, multi-ethnic urban area with opportunities through its trading to influence other cities, other nations, other parts of the Roman Empire. You and I have a missional opportunity in Sacramento, in the Bay Area, in Mexico, and beyond. So, I want to look at these verses again, and I, and I want to provide some points to you to consider if you're open in your heart, in your single life, in your marriage, in your teenage years, in your grandparenting, where you work, where you go to school, where you live, to rise as a reconciler. Verse 14 says, for Christ's love compels us 
because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Here's point one. If we're going to rise as reconcilers, we must rediscover God's love. We must be empowered by it. This word in the Greek for for compelled, it means to be hedged in, surrounded by, controlled, given over to God's love. Why is that important if we're going to rise as reconcilers? Because this is what I've learned, sisters and brothers. There are some things that I can do in my own power, but there's other things that I can't do it unless I'm empowered by God's love. Like, let me give you an example. Excuse me, sir, right here. I don't like you. See, I did that in my own power. Didn't need God, didn't need to join a small group, didn't need to go on a retreat, didn't need to get baptized, didn't need the filling of the Holy Spirit, didn't need to focus on the centrality of God's word. In the name of Ephraim, I could walk up to a guy that doesn't look like me, that I've never met before, don't know his name, don't know his background and say, I don't like you. Tough. See, I mean, I'm sure we'll get along well. Thanks for being in the sermon. But I've learned that I can discriminate, I can be prideful, I can be jealous, I can be envious, I can live in unforgiveness, I can live in sustained anger in my own power. But to love mercy and do justice, to live out righteousness and forgiveness, to be a peacemaker, to be a bridge builder, to be a unifier, to be a vehicle of God's truth, I can't do that in my own power. I need to be empowered by God's love. I need to rediscover God's love daily. It's an opportunity to be showered by God's love. I need, you need, we need to be reminded every day of our lives how deeply loved we are by God. And then we need to understand that God wants to love through us into a broken, divided, upside down world. Ah, every day of your life is an opportunity to say, God, I give you permission. Love my spouse through me. Love my kids through me. Love my siblings through me. Love my coworkers through me. Love my neighbors through me. Love my enemies through me. We need to rediscover God's love. And it also says in verse 16, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. If we're going to rise as reconcilers, we must rediscover God's love. We also must rediscover ourselves and others. See, we live in this broken, bizarro world that basically says this. I mean, this is the world, the upside down world we live in based on your skin color your physical features, where you were born, your accent, if your parents had money or not, your slang, we decide who's smart, who's dumb, who's fast, who's slow, who can clap on beat, and who shouldn't bother. (laughs) We decide who should be revered and who should be feared. That's the broken, upside-down, bizarro world we live in. And so it is important if we're going to rise as reconcilers for us to be aware of the false identities in which we live as human beings and strive for our true identity as one humanity, one race made in the image of God in the very beginning to multiply, be fruitful, and be one under God. Now, I'm not trying to say that issues of race and ethnicity and language and nationality aren't real. They are real. But the way in which we are this diverse nation, but yet deeply divided, is a sign of brokenness, not blessedness. That's what I'm trying to say. We must rediscover ourselves. You know, um, on my mother's side, I can trace my family tree back to my great-great-grandfather, who was full-blooded Irish. Yeah, full-blooded Irish. I know you weren't expecting that. I know. Gotcha. Um, Full-blooded Irish. He married a woman who was Haitian, a descendant of black slaves, and Cherokee in Alabama. That that was controversial, just so you know. But you know what? That's who I am. I'm Irish. I mean, I mean, I get into it. I drink green Kool-Aid on St. Patrick's Day. I'm Irish. <laughs> but I'm also Cherokee. I'm a descendant of black slaves. I'm Haitian. I'm a multi-ethnic, 
multicultural human being. All that is in me. What about you? Your heritage, your roots are more diverse and they're deeper than you give yourself credit. You are more than white, more than yellow, more than red, more than black, more than brown, more than the identities that this world pushes down on you. I'm not saying that the impacts aren't real. They are very real. And I'm just saying, hey, I'm not, no, no, don't get me wrong now, I'm not disappointed in, in being African American. I mean, hey, I mean, my dad's from Louisiana, my mom's from Alabama. I mean, I like fried catfish, cattle greens, yams, sweet tea, cornbread. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm just, we can talk about it later, but I'm just saying, I ain't trying to trade who I am in. I ain't trying to say, hey, can I get that white card? No, I ain't trying to do that. This is how God made me. But I've got to rise as a reconciler in the human package in which God made me and not be enslaved to the broken identities of this world. And when I rediscover myself, I can rediscover people that don't look like me. We need to rediscover ourselves so we can rediscover our brothers and sisters, our neighbors. We have people that are citizens in the kingdom of God all over this world, and we need to treat them and pray for them like family members. We have Christian brothers and sisters in Israel and Palestine, in parts of China, the Ukraine, Russia, Turkey, Iran, Iraq. We must be mindful of them. There are people that don't have the privilege of being able to worship like this with no fear of being arrested and thrown in prison and tortured. And we must be mindful of our global church. It also says here, also towards the end of verse 16, it says, Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. What, what? What? Oh, I think this means we need to rediscover God's love. We need to rediscover ourselves and others. And we need to rediscover Jesus. Why did Paul say we once saw Jesus from a worldly point of view? Maybe this was Paul's own experience. There was a time when Paul, under the name Saul, saw Jesus from a worldly point of view. He saw Jesus as just a religious, heretic troublemaker who was walking the earth saying he was God and king. He said, but you know, we crucified him. <clears throat> and now Paul is going around seeing to it that anyone who follows Jesus will be crucified, crucified upside down, stoned to death, put in prison, beaten publicly, humiliated, until on the road to Damascus, he meets Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. He meets him for himself. He meets the real Jesus. He no longer has a worldly view of Jesus, and, it, and this new understanding of Jesus transforms him. It changes his name. It changes his purpose. It changes his mission. He is transformed. We need to rediscover Jesus if we're going to rise as reconcilers because we still have some worldly versions of Jesus out here. Let me introduce you to some. There's the white Jesus. There's the black Jesus. There's the Republican Jesus. There's the Democrat Jesus. There's the American Jesus. There's the English only Jesus. There's the Hollywood Jesus. There's the television set Jesus. There's the Netflix Jesus. There's all these Jesuses out here. And we need to discover the Jesus of the Bible. We need to discover every day the Savior, the Redeemer, the incarnation of God. God becoming a human being and taking on the full weight of the sins of humanity that we might be purchased back and redeemed and made new. We must rediscover El Shaddai, the Prince of Peace. We must rediscover the Trinity. We must rediscover God's love for us shown best through his son, Jesus Christ. We must rediscover Jesus, the marginalized Messiah who was born in poverty and lived as a refugee and was ridiculed and talked about. They tried to arrest him multiple times. He was beaten mercifully. He was nailed to a cross. This marginalized Messiah who was also the Redeemer died for you and I and rose and we must know him deeply daily. And then it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. 
All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We must rediscover God's love, rediscover ourselves and others, rediscover Jesus, and rediscover our ministry. You have a ministry. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you don't have to go to seminary, get credentialed as a pastor, get on the board of the church, become a deacon. You don't have to have a title. You just have to have a transformable testimony. If you've been transformed by Jesus Christ, if you have the testimony of being redeemed, changed, you have a ministry. God has given you and I the ministry and message of reconciliation, not of judgment, not of pride, not of arrogance, of reconciliation. Let me share something quickly with you. A little over a year ago, a tragic incident happened in South Sacramento. Young African-American man named Stephon Clark died at the hands of two police officers who thought he had a gun, um, believed that he was a suspect in some uh, vandalism and potential burglaries, and thought that maybe he was about to break into a house as they confronted him in a backyard. With all that in their thinking, they shot and killed Stephon Clark. Uh, found out later Stephon Clark didn't have a gun, he had a cell phone, he was in his own grandmother's backyard. That's not to take away from things that he may have been involved in earlier in the night that wasn't good. But that situation caused our city to erupt. Protests, anger, people trying to get people to pick sides. Are you for the police? Or are you with the Clark family? Make a choice. Decide. Are you going to protest? Or are you going to be with them? We weren't able to make that choice at Bayside Midtown Church. You know why? The chief of police and his family attend our church. The deputy chief of police and his family attend our church. The grandparents of Stephon Clark attend our church. We couldn't choose a side. We had to choose a savior. We had to be a bridge over troubled waters. We had to shepherd and love and walk with and pastor. That's the ministry and message of reconciliation. Will you stand in the gap? Will you rise above and be a reconciler? It doesn't mean that I don't have opinions about that situation. It doesn't mean that as an African-American male myself that there weren't struggles going on in my heart, maybe still now, but I had to remember what my ministry is. I had to remember what my calling is. When you go to work tomorrow, I want you to remember your ministry. When you go to school, I want you to remember your ministry. When you go to Mexico, I want you to remember your ministry. When you go home, I want you to remember your ministry. When you're sitting at a coffee shop, I want you to remember your ministry. You know, I was going to close, but I forgot this last part. And then I'm closing, like for real. Um, <laughs> back in verse 15, it says, And he died for all, and those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised. Like, I closed the Bible, so I'm actually like closing. So, look. Rediscover God's love, rediscover ourselves and others, rediscover Jesus, rediscover our ministry, rediscover death. What? I don't even like talking about death. But you know what? If God would ask me how I want to die, I would tell God. Don't you wish God would ask you how you want to die? Come on. I wish God would say, Ephraim, how do you want to die? I would say, thank you for asking, God. I wrote this down in my journal. On my 100th birthday, I want to wake up at noon. Because, I mean, why get up early? It's my last day. I'm sleeping in. So I'm going to wake up at noon, 
And because my dad's from Louisiana and my mom's from Alabama, I want a meal that consists of fried catfish, collard greens, macaroni and cheese, yams, hot water cornbread with melted butter and honey on it with a tall glass of sweet tea, all right? And then I want to follow that up by, with a bowl of warm peach cobbler with three scoops of vanilla bean ice cream melting off the side of the bowl. I want to eat all that and then I want to fall into a deep sleep and wake up in heaven. That's how I want to die. Just like that. 100th birthday, wake up at noon, fried catfish, collard greens, macaroni and cheese, yams, hot water cornbread, melted butter, honey, tall glass of sweet tea, peach cobbler, warm, three scoops of nubbly, ice cream, melon outside the bowl, fall asleep, wake up, hallelujah, Hosanna in the highest. Look at God. That's how. The problem is God won't ask me. But God does invite me. God invites me to die to myself daily. God invites me to die to pride, to die to sustained anger, to die to arrogance and selfishness, to die to the things in me that aren't helpful in rising for the day, rising in the season, rising in the moment. So I have to rediscover death as a spiritual discipline I have to say, God, just killing me, whatever is in there that is not of you. And God will answer that prayer. God is killing me softly with his love, killing me softly with his love, killing me softly. There's a soul singer, Roberta Flack. She had this song, Killing Me Softly. And um, I, I know I'm in church. I probably shouldn't say this, but here we go. Um, the song is about a woman who's sitting in a, in a, in a bar. And there's a guy on stage with a guitar singing. And she realizes after a while, he's singing about her. Singing her whole life. And it's killing her. But yet it's healing her. Maybe that song needs to be your hymn. Strumming my pain with his fingers. Telling my life with his words. Killing me softly with his song. Killing me softly with his song. Telling my whole life with his song. Killing me softly with his song. Would you allow the song of God to be what you need this week? That God's love might shower you, empower you, and grace you like never before. God bless you. Amen.